Today is the 31st Sunday after Holy Pentecost, and we continue in the period of the post-Nativity celebration. In fact, from the time of Nativity for 40 days, we celebrate until the Feast of the Entrance of the Lord into the Temple, also called the Feast of the Purification of the Most Holy Virgin, when on the 40th day after his birth, he was brought to the Temple in Jerusalem, where he was received into the arms of Simeon, the High Priest. That's why this is so long ago. CB is Christ is born. We leave it up until that feast. This whole period of the Nativity, which we're still in and we remain, remember 40 days before Nativity, we started to prepare. On the 21st of uh, November, the feast of the entry of the Theotokos to the temple, which is like a bookend at the first beginning of the feast, Mary, the, the, the young girl, encounters the temple of stone uh, in Jerusalem. And the Temple of Stone ceases to have significance because it's replaced by this Temple of Flesh, which this young girl will become for us the Mother of God. On Christmas we celebrate His Incarnation, where He takes all that we pertains to us on Himself, and He unites all mankind as, by adoption as sons, so that it's no longer the house of Israel alone that's saved, but all mankind is called, by, by Israel, all mankind is called to unity and to salvation in Christ, in God. And his circumcision came eight days after that, it was New Year's Day, where he submitted himself to the brutality of the law, and it was a brutal law, even to the point of wounding in his own flesh, because his parents were observant and they followed the law of Moses, to the wounding of his own flesh as a prefigurement or as a prophecy of his coming wounding in the flesh on the cross, where he would shed his blood once and for all for mankind's salvation. And this period after Christmas, we move for 40 days until the Feast of the Purification. It's just like when somebody has a baby. You know, the, uh, on the first day, we pray for the mother. On the eighth day, we name the child. On the 40th day, the mother brings the child to the temple. We mimic that Old Testament model that was given to us before. Although we're not bound by it, but we mimic it. And to this day, we wait usually 40 days until a child is baptized. But today we hear from the Gospel in the 18th chapter of Luke about a rich young man, it's in all the synoptics, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, about a rich young man who approaches Christ and says to him, what do I need to do? What one thing really is how it's originally in Greek. What one thing need I do to inherit eternal life, to have salvation? He asks this question in all sincerity, we assume. But he doesn't want to hear the answer, and then neither do we, really. Because there is no one thing. Not one thing. It's magic thinking, isn't it? There's nothing we can do anyway. On our own, we can't be saved. Even though we see, and it surrounds us all the time in the lingo, I think people associate Christianity more with this misinterpretation of it than with what it really teaches. Well, the sectarians will say, well, you have to accept Jesus as your personal Savior, say this little penitence prayer, invite Jesus into your heart, be born again, and you're saved. Press it, change it. Not so much. He says to the young man, keep the law. The summation of the law, that law of Moses, is love. Christ finally, once and for all, showed us that. This is what I was trying to tell you. This is what I was trying to communicate to you through my prophets. But you didn't get it. The summation of the law is love. But even that word love, it's so overused, right? I can't imagine preparing a sermon and not having the word love come up. But then when I think about it, how it's so, it's, so, it's become so cheap, the word love. Young people confuse love with the youthful infatuations and lustful thoughts and, and give away their purity when they're 14 years old because they're in love. People talk about loving TV, loving travel, loving things. You know, That word has become so cheap in our common parlance that it's lost its power to a large degree. Sometimes I hate to even use it, because I myself am guilty. I say, oh, I love when it's sunny, or I love that thing you gave me. But we cheapen it when we do that. You know, there's many words for love in Greek. There's only one in English, so it makes it a little bit more difficult. But Christ only gave us four commandments, really, when you think about it. But he says to keep the law, the summation of the law is to 
Love God with all your being. Well, how many of us are accomplishing that? To love, cherish, and nourish your neighbor as yourself. Wow. Don't know how many of us are accomplishing that. Have love among yourselves. That's easier. But even then, sometimes not always possible. In families, we have clashes. In parish communities, clashes. In monasteries, clashes. Pride gets in the way. And finally, do unto others of you as you would have them do unto you. This love that we're called to toward ourselves and by extension toward our neighbors is the love of the image of God in us. It's not a self-indulgent love where we're constantly seeking after uh, rewards and comforts. It's a love of the image of God in ourselves that causes us that calls us to love ourselves. We should love in reference to the fact that we are created in the image of God. We should love our neighbors because they are created in the image of God. This is not a self-indulgent love, but it's a love that shows honor, thanksgiving and respect. I honor God's image in you by loving you. I honor God's image in me by loving myself. If I do that, I won't be fall into these traps of despair and separation where I allow my, myself to become even self-loathing to some degree. Slave to my passions, slave to my addictions, slave to this distorted image that I have rather than the true image that's imprinted in us at our conception by God. This is what we're called to love. To love God with your whole being. And by extension, love is creation. You can't claim to love God and hate his creation. It's impossible. And humanity is the summit of God's creation. But it extends even beyond that to those who we, we see around us, those who have hatred for creation. We see dictators and tyrants falling, it seems like, every day, right? We see starvation. We see revolutions, internecine conflicts. We see the earth be, itself being used by man to the point that it becomes deadened, exploited. Where does hate come from? That's where it comes from. Despising God's creation. You know, we always try to find a way to blame God for all of these things. Why does God let it happen? He doesn't let it happen. We do it. I mean, God doesn't enslave us and say, I want you to love me and you will love me. He gives us a choice. This young man today, because he was rich, isn't why he wasn't saved. He came sincerely asking a question. And Christ saw, he diagnosed his particular ailment. The fathers say about this man, he was possessed by his possessions. It's not because his family was rich or that he had, that he had means, but it's that he was possessed of them. He was not a distributor of them. And if you are possessed by your possessions, and you're not a distributor, and you're uh, some kind of hoarder that shows a lack of love. Because remember, all the excess that you have is taken from those who are in need. The other day I went through my, every January I do it, I go through my drawers and I say, what haven't I worn for the last year? Wow, three bags full. Launder it, fold it, and send it over to the St. Joseph's house, and hopefully somebody will find a use for those sweaters and shirts and things that many of you have given me, by the way. <laughs> Thank you. But there's only so much we need, right? How much do we need? This rich young man was so possessed by his possessions that he missed an opportunity. Christ called him to become his apostle. Sell what you have, give it to the poor, and come and follow me. Those means could have been used to help many people who were sick, many people who were poor and starving. They could have been used also to further Christ's ministry. But instead, it says in the Gospel, he went away sad. He left Christ's presence sad. And that's when Christ said those words that we hear. How hard it will be for a rich man to enter into the kingdom of heaven. He says, yea, it's easier for a camel to go through an eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter into the kingdom of heaven. There's a lot of meanings for what that could mean. What he's trying to say is it's impossible. And the apostles say, well, but who can be saved? Who can 
be saved? Well, by our own merits, none of us. I can't make myself be saved. There was a, a funny story, I hesitate to tell it, but I will anyway, about a man in Romania, I figure he's a Romanian like me, uh, who sued the church because he said, I fasted, I went to church for the feasts, I did everything I was supposed to do, and God didn't reward me with what I needed, so I'm going to sue the church. <laughs> it's funny, right? It's funny. But it's, it just shows this sort of what's seriously lacking in us when we approach God in that manner. We think that, well, I deserve to be saved. I've done all these things. What do you want me to do? What more do I have to do? Really? Do you love God with all your being? And do you love your neighbor as yourself? Really, it's not just love your neighbor as yourself. It's do you cherish and nourish your neighbor as yourself? Do you do unto others as you would have them do unto you? And finally, do you have love amongst yourselves? This is it. This is the criteria. It's, it's sort of the summation of everything that came in the law and the prophets. And if we were able to do it, we would have peace on earth. But we're constantly striving to do it. We're in a state of movement toward that ultimate salvation. And salvation for us is not just being received up into heaven. You know, it's another mis misunderstanding that somehow we're going to lay around on clouds and play harps and it's going to be this really boring scene, which it would be for me, if that's really what it was. Salvation is about becoming what God eternally calls us to be. Becoming not just the image of God that's impr imprinted in us at our conception, but growing in the likeness of Christ. Being recognizably a Christian by our actions, by our deeds, by our words. Recognizably a Christian. People should see us and say, I see something of good there. Gandhi, I always like to use this line, said, I would surely become a Christian if I would be one. So if we fail to be extensions of Christ in the world, if we fail to be instruments of his peace, if we fail to use our means for the extension of the kingdom of God on earth, we have no one to blame but ourselves. The apostles gave all, even though they didn't even know what they were giving it for. They had no idea what Christ was doing up until the very last minute. They didn't know what was happening. They were confused. They were afraid. It was only later, after his resurrection and descent to the Holy Spirit, that they understood. We have that already. But we still don't understand. We're like that rich man, oftentimes. We go away sad, asking too much. It's too much. The church is here to provide us with grace. It's like a fountain of grace. We have the sacraments as a means, as an aid, to live that holy life. But they're not ends in themselves. If you come to church and you receive the sacrament of confession and communion and you don't love your neighbor, you do it unto your own condemnation. It doesn't help you. It's like Judas at the Last Supper. <coughs> And I know that sounds harsh, but it is. The church provides us with grace. God's grace here on earth. Christ's continuing presence. We have to make the effort because grace is not cheap. It's a struggle. It's a struggle to be able to see in myself the image of God. It really is. It's a struggle to be able to see it in my neighbors. It's a struggle to do unto others as I would have them do unto me. All of these things come with labor. Love is work. And if it's not, then it's not love. It's not an emotion. It's not a, a Valentine's Day card and a poem. It's hard work. And it's the work that we're called to do as Christians. To seek and save that which is lost within us, that image of God in us that becomes so covered over with all of our passions and all of our worldly concerns and all that life has to offer. And this life is good, by the way. We give thanks to God for this world and everything that's in it. But we should also honor it as his creation, as we should honor our neighbors and ourselves. So it's the lesson of today's gospel. What would you do, brothers and sisters, if you met Christ? What question would you have? I don't know what that would be. This young man's question went to the very heart 
of his condition. He didn't get the magic bullet. He didn't get a magic answer. The answer he got made of sin. May we not be ever so discouraged that we give up and go away sad. Don't ever give up the struggle. Because Christ did it. These saints are honored not because they're St. John Maximovich or St. Basil the Great or St. Seraphim of Sarov or whoever. The saints are on the walls. They're honored because they achieved in their life the likeness of Christ. We honor them for that. That they're the image of God and they've achieved in their lifetime the likeness of Christ. They became for us little Christ in the world. Light from the effulgence of the Father. Light from the light of God. And that's what we're called to. Is it impossible? No. Is it out of our, our possibilities, out of our reach? Absolutely not. But it does take work. And takes joy. And we're given our entire lifetime to do it. People will come to me in their 30s and they'll say, I just give up. I can't do it anymore. What else do I have to do? Really? Well, how long are you going to live? We'll see. The struggle continues up until that moment. And even after our death, after the separation of our soul from our body, we're not in a stagnant condition. It's always moving from one glory to the next. So when you fall, you get up and you start again and you don't become discouraged. You don't become a slave to your failures. You don't throw yourself over and give yourself up and say, well, that's it. I'm 51, thanks, and I tried it. That's enough. I'm tired. We follow Christ every day of our life until we're unable to do it anymore. That's the Christian struggle. That's really love, to persevere to the end. May we all live long lives, but may we never lose hope. May we never become discouraged or fall into despair. A despair that leads to such sadness and even to suicides. We've all seen it. We've all heard it. People become completely possessed of their, of their possessions. They become possessed of their worldly concerns. They lose sight of what ultimately they should have set their heart on. And they take their own life. But in today's Gospel, we draw hope. Because Christ says, what's impossible for man is possible for God. It's possible with God. It's a synergy, brothers and sisters. Your will and God's grace will bring you to salvation, will make you whole. It's theosis, becoming God-like. That word is really the orthodox understanding of salvation, to become like God. I say you are God's sons of the Most High, said the psalmist David in his psalms as a prophecy of what salvation means. I say ye are God's. Sons of the Most High, all of you. Your will, God's grace, present here in the church, flowing like a river to those who will draw and drink, bringing it not just in this temple, but out into our lives and into the world, so that we become fountains to those who will become in contact with. Little Christs, lights in the darkness. To Christ our God be glory unto the